postdoc doc fellow at the Center for Philosophy of Science, which is this year here, and we've been enjoying having her around for a whole year. She got her PhD in the Department of Logic and Philosophy of Science at the University of Irvine uh, a year ago. She works mostly uh, in the philosophy of biology, but also has done some important work in uh, decision theory. She has broader interest on game theory, epistemology, and feminist philosophy. She has published uh, uh, in Synthese on uh, decision theory and trans transformational experiences. She has, she has also published in biology and philosophy on commitment. And today, Sarah will be talking about a commitment account of norm externalization. Amazing. <laughs> uh, it has gone so, 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 so quickly. Uh, on uh, Friday, uh, we have uh, the last talk uh, organized. Uh, it's the last uh, lecture of the uh, ALS lecture. It's at 3.30 on the 10th floor. It's going to be given by uh, Thomas Ika. I need to double check with him actually. Uh, and um, it's going to be about causal abstraction and computational explanation. It's going to be followed by a reception after the QA. We will be back here at the center in September. Hopefully, if everything goes well, the world has not exploded by then. Uh, uh, and our first talk uh, will be given by uh, David Wallace on September 10th. So you'll be uh, the new Nick Fisher. Uh, <laughs> at least, at least for for four. <laughs> we won't compel you to give all the first talks. As I've, for got, I've got three books coming out before. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Very good. <laughs> all right. So uh, hopefully you you enjoy the talk this semester, and we will see uh, many of you, sadly not all of you, uh, next uh, next semester. Um, Today, it's my uh, pleasure to reintroduce uh, our speaker, Sarah Kahn. Uh, Sarah got her PhD at uh, LPS at Irvine. Uh, she works in the field of, she's been our postdoctoral fellow here at the Center for a year. Uh, she works in the philosophy of biology, also in decision theory. In the philosophy of biology, her work is about the evolution of cooperation with a focus on commitment. On commitment. It's an interdisciplinary work between anthropology, biology, biology psychology, psychology, modeling together. She has published in synthesis and transformative experience in biology and philosophy on commitment. Uh, and she is going uh, to lead us, um, sadly, very soon. But if you haven't talked to her, it's a, an opportunity you must. Uh, spent uh, some time talking to her. Uh, she uh, is going to Bristol to work with uh, Samir uh, Okesha and live in two weeks, I believe. Next week. <laughs> yeah, next week. Next week, take your agenda <laughs> and check the, the few opening if you haven't had any time to uh, to work with her. And uh, today, uh, Sarah is going to be talking about the commitment account of norm externalization. Thank you. Um, so welcome to the grand finale of the lunchtime talk series. <laughs> <laughs> Hope it doesn't disappoint. So today I'll be offering a commitment account of norm externalization. Let's start with the thesis, with the general thesis. So some have thought that moral norms differ fundamentally in character from conventional norms, and this is not uncontentious. And a key part of the difference is thought to be this phenomenon called externalization. To say that a norm is externalized is to say the norm is experienced as imposed on us from the outside and exacting a demand on all, regardless of group. And this is an idea owing to Kyle Stanford. Stanford argued that externalization evolved to facilitate correlated interaction among cooperators. And this explains its emergence. But the mechanism by which it secures correlated interaction is left unspecified in Stanford's work. So in this talk, I am to fill that gap. Oh. I argue that the mechanism behind correlated interaction is commitment. In addition, I offer an account of the emergence of externalized norms that situates their evolution as part of a larger co-evolution of commitment and cooperation over human evolutionary history. So here's an overview of what we'll be talking about today. First, I'll go through the concept of externalization. Then I'll talk about correlated interaction and commitment in the context of the evolution of cooperation more generally. Then I'll introduce the notion of moralized commitment, which is the way in which externalized norms, I believe, facilitates correlated interaction. Then I'll talk about the emergence of externalized norms, as I said, owing to a co-evolution of commitment and cooperation over our evolutionary history. 
And we'll talk about the fitness advantages that moralized commitment offers. So first, externalization. I'm gonna take a short detour by way of talking about the moral conventional divide in psychology. This is the idea that moral norms form a distinct category as opposed to conventional norms. So cross-cultural research has suggested that we distinguish moral from conventional violations at a young age. In particular, there are findings of that of this, um, such as children think that grapes are yummy only for some people, but they don't make such concessions in the case of morally good or bad actions, such as monkeys helping each other. These are get treated more objectively, they're not a matter of taste, whereas taste judgments are not objective. It has been found that there is a systematic correlation between disagreement on moral issues and preference for social and physical distance, while there is no such correlation in non-moral values controlling for attitudinal strength. However, this is there's a lot of work also going on to say this divide doesn't exist very neatly. For example, um, some people have found that cleaning one's toilet with the national flag is viewed as moralized. Religions may moralize issues such as sexual purity. Uh, indeed, uh, Edward found that Indian and Muslim societies don't make, uh, or particularly Hindu societies, don't make distinctions between conventional and moral norms. It's also been found that etiquette trans transgressions trigger feelings of disgust, which we usually think are associated with moral transgressions. The important part of this account, though, is externalization. And that's one feature that's thought to distinguish moral norms from conventional norms. This we do have evidence for. Experiments have shown that there, that there exist judgments whereupon disagreement between parties is taken to be an indication that one party is mistaken. And what this shows is that the, the judgment that is externalized applies to all, regardless of group. It's a standard that's imposed on us from the outside. It's objective and universal. So what, as I said, while we are concerned with externalized norms rather than moral norms, the latter will act as a good proxy for the former, since many typical moral norms, murder is wrong, lying is wrong, stealing is wrong, are unconditionally obligatory, generalizable, and impersonal, that is, externalized. Since the literature on uh, moral norms is much more rife than the literature on specifically externalized norms, that's the sort of literature that we'll be appealing to in making this argument. But the important part of this account, again, is that we externalize some norms, whether or not it, this perfectly aligns with moral norms, whether or not the boundary of what counts as externalized is clear or not, and whether it exists on a continuum or not. In fact, it probably does exist on a continuum. So again, Stanford has argued that externalization establishes connection between an agent's own motivation to adhere to a certain norm and her means of choosing reliable partners. What does he mean by this? He says, externalization facilitated a broader shift to a vastly mostly more cooperative form of social life by establishing and maintaining a connection between the extent to which an agent is herself motivated by a given moral norm and the extent to which she uses conformity to that same norm as a criterion in evaluating candidate partners in social interaction generally, since externalized norms are those that we believe apply to everyone, regardless of group. This connection ensures, that, ensures the correlated interaction necessary to protect those prepared to adopt increasingly cooperative, altruistic, and other pro-social norms of interaction from exploitation especially as such norms are applied in novel ways and or to novel circumstances, and as the rapid establishment of new norms allowed us to reap still greater rewards from hyper-cooperation. So this is the role that he sees externalization playing, and in particular, it's the, role, it's the role that explains the emergence of externalization, this benefit that it confers. However, the mechanism behind such correlated interaction is not specified. In particular, how do agents come to know others' beliefs about externalized norms, and how does this confer a fitness benefit? We need to know these things in order for Stanford's account to work. So I argue that the game theoretic concept of commitment provides a bridge between Stanford's work on externalization and the confer of fitness benefit he needs it to achieve to explain its emergence and its role. 
So that's terms of correlated interaction and commitment. Correlated interaction emerges as a theory in response to the problem of the evolution of cooperation. Indeed, the evolution of distinctively human processiality is the target of Stanford's inquiry, and it has been of interest to philosophers, biologists, and anthropologists for centuries. Darwin raised the problem in The Descent of Man, where he said, he who is ready to sacrifice his life, as many a savage has been, rather than betray his comrades, would often leave no offspring to inherit his noble nature. So the problem is that organisms cooperate widely, and this is an observed phenomenon, but cooperation is risky. If profit is differentially distributed or if cooperating involves costly mistakes, agents might do better by not cooperating than by cooperating. So the theory is to explain when there is an incentive to defect and how do we explain why organisms do cooperate. In other words, natural selection favors those traits which contribute to reproductive success, yet cooperation can be costly to one's own fitness. And many theories have been proposed to account for the evolution of cooperation in the face of these incentives to defect or to avoid risks. And many of these theories in particular have appealed to something called correlation devices. Correlation devices are mechanisms by which cooperators identify and preferentially interact with other cooperators. So, for example, kin selection. In kin selection, cooperators selectively interact with other cooperators either through familial bonds or through limited dispersal. In theories such as uh, Robson's secret handshake theory or the Greenbeard effect, correlated interaction is secured by identifiable phenotypic markers. So, the idea is that the cooperative gene is systematically linked to some other gene that expresses, that shows some phenotypic expression. So then cooperators can identify other cooperators and preferentially interact with them. Something similar can be said about reciprocal altruism. Cooperators interact with like kind because they withhold cooperative behavior from those who are non-cooperative. Likewise, in indirect reciprocity, we use reputation as a means of discriminating among potential partners. So we look at their past record of play and those who are cooperators will be preferentially interacted with. The correlation device that's the subject of this talk, and that I think explains commitment, uh, explains externalization, is commitment. Commitment is the theory owing to Schelling in 1960, and he says a commitment is a strategic move that induces another player to choose in one's favor. And the alteration of the, it does this by constraining the other player's choice by affecting her expectations. So in particular, a rational second player can be constrained by her knowledge that the first player has altered her own incentive structure. So the first player's alteration of her own incentive structure, her constraining of her future choice, can be worsening one's payoff in the event of non-fulfillment. It can be delegation of control to another. These commitments are then communicated verbally or non-verbally um, to the other agent, which then alters her expectations. It's supposed that these are situations where the commitments are used in situations where by undertaking the commitment, an agent will uh, constrain her future choice in such a way that she optimizes her long-term utility, even though cheating looks better in the short term. So to give you an example, to make this more concrete, imagine we are playing a game of chicken where two people are driving towards each other on a narrow road. And the idea is you don't want to be the one to swerve because this shows that you're the coward. You want to be the one to drive on and make the other person swerve because this shows that you're courageous. One way you can commit to driving on is tearing off your steering wheel. This makes the option swerving, option off swerving impossible. This is then, if the other agent, the agent sees it, it's a signal to the other agent that you are, that you've altered your own incentive structure. You are now incentivized to drive. And if they see that, uh, this changes their expectations of what you're going to do, which then alters their own choice, because both driving at the same time is the worst outcome. You'll crash. So they want to swerve, meaning you'll win the game of chicken. Likewise, we can make it fit the definition a little bit better, um, not by removing an option, but by making an option less attractive. So suppose we, suppose we lay out our CD collection on the side of the road. This makes the options observably swerving 
less desirable since swerving uh, will destroy my CD collection. And if this is so, I'm incentivized to drag on the receiver of that commitment signal sees that. They change what they want to do. Um, so they swerve, I drive, I win. Um, so this is how commitment in general will work in a situation of conflict of interest. But commitments need not be only restricted to situations of conflict of interest. It need not be that I win and you lose. So if we consider situations of mutual benefit represented by the stag hunt, we know there are two Nash equilibria, both where we play stag or both where we play hair. Um, but the hair hair outcome has the larger basin of attraction in evolutionary games. That is, it's chosen more often, it's risk dominant. So the question is, how do we get to stag stag? And in the case of a commitment, if a commitment was employed, and this is just a stylistic example of how commitment would look, the agent who's committing Rho is changing her payoff matrix such that hair no longer becomes the no longer becomes an option for her. It's strictly dominated by stag. So if she reduces her payoff for hair, and this is signaled to the receiver, the receiver column is then incentivized to play stag, and they both land on the mutually beneficial outcome. So here is a definition of commitment that I'll be working with. It's my own definition, but it's closely based on Schelling's work. A commitment is a pre-play signal in a strategic interaction taken at time t that increases the sender's relative payoff for carrying through option x at time t plus n, some later time, and increases the receiver's expectation that the sender carries through that option. And again, the point here is that option X is the better long run option for the agent and the commitment allows her to overcome a short term incentive to defect. So how does this apply in the case of externalized norms? This is what I'll be calling moralized. It's moralized in air quotes because as I've said, said externalization doesn't necessarily perfectly coincide with what's moral. We're just going to use that as a proxy since it often does. So here's what I think moralized commitments are, in particular, what the role of externalization is in making these commitments. So when we say things like stealing is stealing figs is wrong, or it's so wrong that Edouard stole all the figs, or we tell a story or fable <laughs> about how terrible it is that Edouard stole these figs, what we're doing is sending a signal that's constraining our future choice, because externalized norms, we're signaling our attitude about externalized norms. And externalized norms are taken not only to apply to the person who you are criticizing about the externalized norm, but also since they apply to all, irregardless of group, the person who is doing the criticizing. So if Havi tells Musa, for example, stealing is wrong and subsequently chooses to steal, Musa believes him to be a hypocrite. If this is so, this utterance changes Havi's relatives' pay payoffs for stealing figs as it risks potential exclusion from future interaction. Should Musa believe that he's a hypocrite after he's uttered that he thinks stealing is wrong and he's subsequently stolen? Then he's altered his future, he's altered his incentives for his future course of action because if he's excluded, there is a cost to acting, not acting in line with the signal that he's expressed. At the same time, the utterance changes Musa's expectations of having his future action. He expects him not to steal. So it meets our two criteria of what we expect of a commitment, that the receiver's expectations of, have, of the sender's future action have changed, but also that the sender's relative payoffs for carrying through that future action have changed. And the change in the sender's relative payoffs is coming by way of fear of potential exclusion or of potential exclusion. Note that the sender of the commitment signal need not take the norm to be externalized in order to fare better if she follows through on her commitment. So Javi doesn't really need to believe that stealing is wrong. It just needs to be the case that Musa believes that Javi believes that stealing is wrong. Because if Musa believes that Javi believes that stealing is wrong, then Musa is prepared to exclude him on the basis of a proxy when he does steal. Is that clear to everyone? Okay, good. 
So to fit it into the definition that I provided earlier, there's a pre-placed signal, and that's a direct assertion of a moral wrong, stealing is wrong, moral gossip, it's so uh, terrible that Edward stole the figs, or uh, some sort of fable. And I'm sure there are other ways we can signal our attitudes about certain life norms too. The option X that the agent is incentivized to follow through, to follow through on is adhering to that, to that externalized norm, or the, or the attitude, attitude expressed in the externalized norm. Time T plus N is when the interaction concerning the norm takes place. So the agent would need to be in a situation where they are able to steal things and they can demonstrate whether or not they're going to act in line with that commitment. So if Javi criticizes Edouard, for example, for, you know, this example is coming for neglecting his child, <laughs> Uh, but he doesn't have, but Javi doesn't have any children of his own. And then time T plus N is in the distant future or may never arise. So commitments would need to be either sensitive to the memory of the agent or time T plus N, time T and time T plus N would need to be short in order for these commitments to be most credible. The short-term incentive that the agent is overcoming when they make this commitment is to act in their own interest. And there are times when our expression of externalized norms and the commitments that we're making and the, uh, the agent's own incentives will come apart. So Javi might want to steal figs. Javi might really like figs. Uh, and the commitment is ensuring that he overcomes this short-term incentive. So much of the forthcoming discussion will also focus on gossip just because it is shown to be a much more reliable indicator of someone's future attitudes than direct assertions like stealing is wrong. There are psychological studies which show that saying it's so terrible that somebody else stole is a more reliable indicator of your future behavior. And in fact, we often engage in such moral gossip. Um, the cost to reneging that incentivizes option X. As I said, is potential exclusion by one's partner in repeated interaction on the basis of hypocrisy or exclusion from others on the, as a consequence of a tarnished reputation. So as long as reputation sharing is play is at play, if Javi goes on to steal the fig, Mr. can tell other people, and other people will exclude Javi from future beneficial interaction. So we want to know two things uh, for these commitments to work in the way that I'm expecting to. We want to know that there are future opportunities for beneficial interaction, else there would be no cost to, its, to defection, because it doesn't matter if you're excluded. And we want to know that there really is a cost imposed, that ex social exclusion does really occur. The first condition, I think, is just met in, in virtue of the fact that we have interconnected groups with reputation sharing. There are opportunities for future beneficial interaction. The second condition we need more evidence for, that there is punishment for defection. So it's been well documented that social exclusion, this kind of punishment for defection that I'm talking about that I need, is an effectively employed, employed means of punishment for norm violation. Ruda and colleagues, for example, find evidence that ostracism of a target is viewed as legitimate when the target's behavior violates social norms, but many examples of the norms that they cite are typically moral, lying, stealing, and thus likely externalized. The approximate mechanisms by which norm violation is punished include powerful moral emotions, too. Anger not only plays a role in why we punish people for violation of social norms, but also guilt which mediates retaliation for this punishment. But we want to know not only that norm violation is punished, we also want to know that it's punished more severely when preceded by moral ass assertions than when it is not. We want to know that the commitment's doing some work here, that the signal is raising our cost for defection, i.e. reneging on, it's, has a greater cost than simply defection. This is why the commitment would incentivize the agent to follow through on her option. So I think there is evidence that we do punish more severely when, when, moral, when norm transgressions are preceded by signaling. So there's much evidence about adaptations we have for Schadenfreude, and this is amplified when a person is found to be doing the same action as they were criticizing other for, others for. And this shows that hypocrisy is viewed negatively, um, signal, i.e. signaling one's attitude increases the cost of defection. 
Furthermore, a study by Jordan et al. found that hypocrites are perceived more negatively than individuals who engage in the same transgressive behavior without engaging in prior gossip. That is, signaling increases the cost of defection. More negatively than direct liars who asserted they didn't engage in such behavior, yet did so. And this is to the point that moral gossip is a particularly salient way of signaling these attitudes towards externalized norms more than direct assertions. And more negatively, importantly, than honest hypocrites who admit they sometimes transgress. So this point shows that since honest hypocrites are not judged so severely, what, what explains, explains our negative attitudes towards hypocrites is not their unpredictability or their weak-willed nature or something of that sort, but that they have deceptively signaled their attitude. So the ones who are honest, who haven't deceptively signaled their attitude, are not punished so severely. So here's an interim summary from what I've argued so far. Just that externalized norms facilitate correlated interaction by way of moralized commitments. And moralized commitments change sender incentives and receiver expectations. So now, so now we'll move on to, to sorry. The emerge, oh God, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> 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 Where were you? Um, section four. Thank you. Okay. As I said in this section, I'm going to argue that the emergence of moralized commitments is itself attributable to the co-evolution of commitment and cooperation over human history. And this is building on some previous work of mine. So in previous work, I've argued that commitment and cooperation co-evolved over human history. Um, starting with commitment via shared activity. And I think that this um, is an explanation for early hominin group hunting. So the idea is that, I won't go into too much detail here because this is a different paper, um, but enough that you sort of get the point, uh, which is participation in shared activities um, is a signal of intended cooperation, which changes sender incentives and changes receiver expectations. So it's a commitment. Uh, and the commitment raises the cost of defection again by the same mechanisms as moralized commitment, but it makes a uh, it makes the renega vulnerable to potential exclusion. Follow, uh, so following through on one's signal of intended cooperation in a group hunt becomes the optimal option. In previous work, I've argued that group hunting and other shared activities underscored by commitment contributed to the formation of larger multi-level groups, which set the stage for the evolution of decontextualized and abstract language. And this resulted in the possibility and indeed created the selection pressure for the evolution of a more effective form of commitment, linguistic commitment. And there are obvious reasons why linguistic commitment is more effective than pre-linguistic commitment. So here we'll be arguing that moralized commitment is part of the same co-evolutionary story. And in doing so, I'll make two kinds of claims about this co-evolution. One is about uh, previous practices of commitment and cooperation providing the um, emotional and cognitive precursors to the emergence of moral cognition or, or moral uh, motivation as well. Uh, and one is about previous practices of commitment and cooperation leading to the selective environment, environment that, that favored, favored the, development the development of moral cognition. And these are two different claims because something can be a precursor without being, without uh, contributing to the selection pressure. So our vocal cord anatomy is a precursor to a uh, naturalized language as we know it, but it doesn't provide the selection pressure for language evolution. What provides the selection pressure is arguably situations of coordination. So first on the precursors to morality. So I think one of the cognitive uh, requirements for 
for moral cognition is perspective taking. Um, many people in the tradition of Piaget uh, see moral understanding as fundamentally involving the capacity for perspective taking. So to cite a few, Goldman writes, paradigm cases of empathy consist first of taking the perspective of another person, that is imaginatively assuming one or more of the other person's mental states. Day argues that grasping right and wrong depends on taking another's perspective and imagining feelings of frustration or anger. And Gordon um, fleshes this out a little bit more and shows how this turns into moral norms. He says, imagine being in X's situation once with the further, uh, so imagine taking that perspective, once with the further adjustments required to imagine being X in X's situation and once without these adjustments. If your response is the same in each case, approve X's conduct, if not disapprove. And we don't need to simply agree with these authors who, um, who subscribe to the Piaget in tradition to think that perspective taking is important in morality. Many, many other people do as well. So if we think of Tomasello, for example, he believes that the origins of morality lie in the recognition of the interdependence we have with others. He thinks he thinks a we is created by social commitments that make legitimate decisions for the self and others, and this creates obligations for people with moral identities in moral communities. And it is important to Thomas Eller's account on the evolution of morality that this derives from shared intentional activities where perspective taking is important. Participation in such activities involve, involves participants taking on another's perspective and trying to manipulate their perspective by using cooperative communication. Later on in Tomasello's account, this develops into taking on an agent neutral perspective, and this is what underlies moral judgments. Darwell also has a view of morality where perspective taking is crucial. He thinks uh, uh, perspective taking on second and third personal perspectives in relations to the claims we make on one another's conduct and will is an important part of moral judgment. And indeed, this perspective taking, that perspective taking is important, is important for the evolution of moral cognition, is supported by the fact that there is a difference between humans and apes with respect to morality. Humans, but not other apes, arguably exhibit moral norms, and this might be because of our perspective taking capacity. So there's been plenty of evidence that joint intentionality of the sort Tom Sello uh, espouses, it's exhibited in children but not apes. So it's been found that while chimps demonstrate the capacity to take on another's perspective in competitive tasks, so if you, if they're trying to get food and it's in the view of another dominant chimpanzee, they'll choose food hidden from the view of the dominant chimpanzee, so they're representing the perspective of the dominant chimpanzee and avoiding doing something that will incur some cost. But in the case of cooperative tasks, they can't take on another, another's perspective. So they can't understand when humans try to altruistically guide their attention to something that will benefit them. So if a human points to the location of food, they don't understand this. So it's likely that commitment by a shared activity characteristic of the hominin lineage plays a large role in the, the development of such perspective taking capacities. Indeed, that's what I've argued. I have argued previously that a key component in the development of perspective taking capacities were the requirements of effective action in shared activities, such as early hominin group hunting, which were underscored by commitment. So to give you an example of how these shared activities require perspective taking, again, drawing on Do Tomasello just briefly, um, Tomasello argues that in order for, I mean, he doesn't know Havi or Musa, but in order for Havi to understand why Musa points at a banana tree, he must understand that Musa is trying to inform him of something relevant to their current task of banana gathering. So this requires um, Havi being able to take on Musa's perspective in a situation of joint activity. So, Perspective taking capacities developed in situations of joint activity are an important step in coming to make agent neutral judgments characteristic of moral judgment, moral, uh, moral judgments. And if something like the account of moral cognition that I've given is right, 
then it's crucial to the development of a sense of right and wrong. Another way in which I think uh, earlier forms of commitment set the foundations for moral motivation are in the development of our effective mechanisms. So Nichols argues that perspective taking alone, alone isn't, isn't, enough isn't enough for us for, us for, for morality. morality. Psychopaths provide a counterexample. They, they have perspective taking capacities which are perfectly developed, but this is en not enough to explain full moral psychology because they don't have the helping behavior associated with moral motivation. In particular, we need something like empathy or emotional contagion that helps motivate moral, uh, moral helping behavior. And I think commitment via shared activity creates a selective pressure for experiencing the effective states of others, which provides this motivational force. So shared activities such as hunting create social bonds more powerful, Sorelny argues, than, whole, than bonding established in calmer waters. And this is evidenced by many studies in war. Similarly, our parenting, which is possibly also underscored by commitment, engages our dopamine and oxytocin-related reward systems. Our brains are registered to wire the signal, uh, registered to notice the signals of infants' needs and our reward systems to reinforce a helping response. So these shared activities, which I believe are underscored by commitment, nurture effective mechanisms that respond to the distress cues of others. And if this account of moral motivation is correct, this perspective taking an effective mechanism account of moral motivation, then shared activity based on commitment played a role in the development of moral cognition. Not only through providing the kinds of coordination problems that developed our perspective taking capacities, but also in strengthening our effective mechanisms through social bonding and through um, all of these things involved in our parenting. Of course, that's not to say that pro-social emotions like empathy didn't exist before these shared activities. It's just to say that all that moral cognition could not have evolved before these shared activities, but that our cooperative activities further built upon our tendencies to behave pro-socially and so favor the development of moral thought. So we have most of the stage setting, i.e. the precursors to moral cognition, the role of previous practices of commitment and cooperation in creating the precursors to moral cognition. Now we want to know why it emerged, i.e. what provided the selective environment for the emergence of externalized norms. And again, I think this goes back to early shared activities. So as I said in previous work, I argue that group hunting and other such shared activities, which I believe were underscored by commitment, led to the emergence of larger multi-level groups by a number of effects, the development of more sophisticated tools, a division of labor and specialization, new cognitive capacities, capacities for cooperative interaction in infants and expansion of terrestrial habitats, et cetera, et cetera. Language, uh, also allowed us to engage in larger scale collective action problems and with the ability to communicate about specific divisions of labor. But in these larger and more complex societies created by these shared activities, opportunities to stabilize cooperation through partner choice become less effective because we might not interact with the same partner twice. So, sorry, through partner control. So partner choice becomes a more effective, more, uh, necessary means to secure effective cooperation. We face greater pressure for effective partner choice mechanisms to evolve. It's been argued that partner choice psychology depends on two components. One that infers beliefs and desires, and another, a second component that, given instances of beliefs, desires, and action patterns, infers psychological dispositions or character. So we face selection pressure to evidence this disposition. Yet to appear to be moral but not actually be moral is a difficult Machiavellian strategy to, to effect. So one way to reliably advertise our psychological dispositions and to have them be credible 
is to view these view norm, moral norms as externalized. So externalization advertises one's trustworthiness. But if that was all that was needed for reliable dispositions for trustworthiness to be evidenced, why would natural selection not have opted for simply instilling in us a strong desire to act morally rather than creating this complex phenomenology of externalization where, where I believe this norm has to apply to all, regardless of group, I take it to be objective and universalized? Well, here the answer is that externalization has dual functions. It not only motivates me to act morally and evidences this disposition to others, but it also, at the same time, protects me from exploitation by others because it demands conformity to that norm from others. So there's a systematic connection between an agent's own motivation to adhere to a certain norm. And this is something that Stanford has stressed. As in their own motivation to adhere to a certain norm and their means of choosing reliable partners. So this is a wise mechanism for partner choice by making that connection. And it's, and it's a wiser mechanism than reputational means alone because reputation it's a means by which third party information can be used to discriminate among potential partners, but it doesn't directly advertise our own trustworthiness to others, at least not in the absence of commitment. So here's another interim summary of what this section has been about. So I've argued that there's a co-evolutionary relationship between commitment and cooperation, and it looks as follows. Shared activities underscored by commitment, shared activities such as hunting, Developed perspective taking capacity, developed our perspective taking capacities and strengthened our effective mechanisms. And these were the cognitive and emotional precursors for the emergence of externalized norms. Once we had externalized norms, we could make moralized commitments, which I've argued secure correlated interaction among cooperators. Second, I've argued that shared activities underscored by commitment, hunting, allo parenting, etc resulted in the formation of larger multi-level groups. And this was the selective environment in which partner choice became paramount for sustaining cooperation. Externalization then emerged as a means of advertising one's trustworthiness and a means of choosing reliable partners. Once externalization emerged, we were able to make moralized commitments, which secured better correlated interaction among cooperators. So here we have a fuller account of the function and of the function and emergence of externalization than was initially put forth in Stanford's work. Finally, we also want to know that moralized commitment offers some fitness advantages, because I've argued that there are previous forms of commitment, commitment that um, by a shared activity, linguistic commitment that was not moralized. So why do we need moralized commitment? We want to know that it offers some additional advantages that explains its emergence. And I'll offer three. Or will I? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first is that I think that it screens off other information, and I'll explain what this means. A so gossip commitments, which are non-moralized, only apply where the receiver has reason to believe that the sender is part of the same cultural group and occupies the same social role as the person about whom they are gossiping. I'll give you an example. So suppose Javi says to Musa, it's terrible that Edouard did not attend the fortnightly ritual dance. If in order for Musa to take Javi to be making a commitment to act in similar fashion to attend the fortnightly, uh, to act in dissimilar fashion, to attend the fortnightly ritual dance, Musa needs to know that Javi is part of the same cultural group as Edouard. Maybe it's only pit philosophers who attend the fortnightly ritual dance. If Javi isn't a pit philosopher, then he wouldn't be obligated, obligated by his accession to attend the fortnightly ritual dance. So the commitment only works if Musa knows that Javi is part of the same cultural group as Edouard. He also needs to occupy the same social role. If it's only, um, what's a social role? <laughs> I should have thought about this before. Um, I don't know, imagine some social role that Edward occupies that Javier doesn't. Um, then maybe only in virtue of that social role is Edward obligated to attend the fortnightly ritual dance. 
if Javi doesn't occupy that same social role, his utterance doesn't commit him to also acting in line with the externalized norm that he's expressed. In contrast, when Javi says it is wrong that Edward stole all the figs, Musa does not need to know anything about Javier to take him to be committed to not stealing figs. It doesn't matter that um, if only uh, if only French people, for example, were not supposed to steal figs. Because stealing figs is externalized. It applies equally to all, regardless of group, regardless of social role. So in this sense, it's easier for Musa to take Habi to be making a commitment, and it's easier for Habi to also make that commitment. In other words, externalization screens off other features of the agent as irrelevant to understanding them as having made a commitment. The commitment is, in a sense, more automatic, which is useful in larger networks where we might not know things about the sender's cultural group or social role. So commitments become easier to advertise, since they require less information, and they become easier to discern for the receiver, both aiding and wise partner choice. There's a second advantage, I think. Um, sorry. Moralized commitment signals the sender's intended action, as does any commitment. But moreover, it simultaneously signals to the receiver that she is willing to exclude others for stealing figs, since it applies again to everyone, irrespective of group, irrespective of role. The norm applies not only to when we express an externalized norm, we're applying that norm not only to ourselves, which is constraining our future action, we're applying it to the person about whom we're gossiping, we're applying it to Edouard, and also to the receiver of the commitment signal. So when Musa sa when Javi says to Musa, it's so terrible that Edouard stole the figs, he's not only saying that he's not going to steal figs, he's not only saying it's that Edouard shouldn't steal figs, but he's also saying that Musa shouldn't steal figs, that he's prepared to exclude Musa on the basis of acting not in line with that expressed externalized norm. And this, and this is beneficial for the sender insofar as it protects her from interaction with those who are likely to behave differently to her since she has revealed that she will not interact with them in the future if they do so. A final fitness advantage. Um, moralized language is especially meaningful for predicting future behavior. That it has, it has additional credibility as a commitment signal than non-moralized language. It's more, um, and this has been evidenced by psychology studies, it's more credible, it, or it means more for my future behavior, for you predicting my future behavior, for me to say something like, it would be wrong for me to not help you with fig gathering, versus I will help you with fig gathering. Those carry different connotations and then they change receiver expectations in different ways. So those who either directly assert their moral values or condemn the immoral behavior of others are judged to be more moral themselves or less likely to commit the state of trans transgressions. I think this credibility may come from the motivational power of new proximate mechanisms associated with moral emotions, guilt and shame, for example. It's more likely for me to believe your commitment when I think that you would feel guilty if you reneged, since it's morally valenced, uh, than if you were just afraid of the potential reputational reper repercussions. The fear of ostracism isn't as credible in motivational power. And this becomes particularly important as we transition into larger and more complex societies where reputation may not reach everyone in the network. So to conclude, Stanford has argued that externalization evolves to facilitate correlated interaction, and so this explains its emergence. However, he failed to specify the mechanism by which this correlated interaction is secured. I have argued that externalization, externalized norms facilitate correlated interaction via commitment. Through what I'm calling moralized commitment, we can simultaneously signal that we have constrained our future actions by raising our cost of reneging, um, and change a receiver's expectations of our future actions, incentivizing them to cooperate with us in turn. 
I've also argued the emergence of externalization is itself attributable to the core evolution of commitment and cooperation over human history. The cognitive capacities which co-evolved with early shared activities based on commitment set the stage for the emergence of moral cognition, both in further developing our perspective taking capacities and also strengthening, also strengthening our effective mechanisms. Alongside, Alongside the larger and more complex societies we then face, this led to the emergence of norm externalization as a means of correlating interaction. Finally, I've argued that commitment on the basis of externalized norms offers fitness advantages over commitments which are not made on the basis of externalized norms, which helps to explain their emergence. By moralizing commitment, we are able to abstract away from details about the sender's cultural background and social role when attributing commitments. Moralized commitments not only used to advertise our future course of action, but it's to also to hold others accountable to signal our expectations of the receiver. And moral judgment uh, comes carries with it powerful motivational forces which lend credibility to these commitments. Thank you. Can we take a two-minute break and then we have a time for questions? Uh,